Hello and welcome. My name is Peter Moser and I'm a songwriter, a composer, a street musician, a performer and a community musician at heart. Working with and in communities in the northwest of England and across the world in various different places. And I've always been fascinated by the way that cultural activity can support political change, how protest and culture connect, whether they're in the murals in Chile in the 60s and early 70s, or in the parading bands and demonstrations that you find in, that I've been on in the UK. And this was to have been a totally interactive workshop, writing songs, singing songs, and now it's become a film. And and I hope I can maintain some of those aspects of interactivity. So throughout the session, starting now, if please do write your thoughts in the chat about your relationship to protest, particular feelings, and we might well use those words later in making a song. Um, it's such a huge topic. And today I'm really gonna just draw on my own personal experiences in Hong Kong over the last few years and also in London on Extinction Rebellion events. And I've also interviewed a few people and shared, and I'll share their, their thoughts in films, but I was particularly also very curious about how um, music and song have played a part in the Black Lives Matter protests, which, which I haven't been part of, and see whether there's been any ways that that's very different, in any way different to my experience. So I'll talk about that a bit later on. Time for Song, um, written by uh, the amazing poet Adrian Mitchell, a great friend of mine and somebody I worked with for many years. And it was written in the mid 60s when the first images of the earth came back from space. And um, he wrote it then and it was then used by very various different people and turned into song by my friend Boris Howarth. It goes like this. You can copy, it's a call and, call and response. So just copy each phrase. When man first flew beyond the sky, when man first flew beyond the sky, he looked back into the world's blue eye. He looked back into the world's blue eye. Man said, what makes your eyes so blue? Man said, what makes your eyes so blue? Earth said, the tears in the ocean do. Earth said, the tears in the ocean do. Why are the seas so full of tears? Why are the seas so full of tears? Because I've wept so many thousand years. Because I've wept so many thousand years. Why do you weep as you dance through space? Why do you weep as you dance through space? Because I am the mother of the human race. Because I am the mother of the human race. Now, is that a protest song? Hmm. Interesting, we'll talk about that later. Um, through the workshop, I'm going to look at three particular themes. One is how community music values and practice intersect with the world of protest song. The second is talking about the songs that actually happen on the streets that are an essential part of that process, protest, protest, process. And, and the music in the marching bands as well. Um, you'll hear from George Mackay um, later talking about the soundtrack of the insurrection, of the taking of the, the resounding of the streets. And the third is the, the aspect of narrative songs that tell the story, document and focus attention on the wider community. They may not happen on the streets, but we know how essential they are to the political process and how they move it on. And now to our second song. Um, I was singing this um, on the Extinction Rebellion protests in London last autumn. Um, I don't know what its origins are. It's a, it's a three minute track, so um, just join in, improvise. The words are very simple. People gonna rise like water, turn this system round in the voice of my great granddaughter, climate justice now, just enjoy.
people gonna rise like the water turn this system round in the voice of my great granddaughter climate justice now people gonna rise like the water turn this system round in, in the voice, voice of my great granddaughter, a climate justice now. A people gonna rise like a people gonna rise. 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 A turn this system round. Like the waters, gonna turn this system around. In the rise of my great in the road, in the climate justice, climate justice. Now, people gonna rise like the water, turn this system around. Sister, the voice of my great grand, the voice of my great grand, the climate justice now. Climate justice now. People gonna rise like the war. People gonna rise like the turn this system around. People gonna rise in the voice of my great grand. The people gonna rise like the climate justice now. Justice now. People gonna rise like the people gonna turn this system around. Turn this system in the voice of my great grand in the climate justice now. So, so what was the experience like? It was, was it easy to join in? It was repetitive. It wasn't performance focused, um, reinvented many, many versions. That's my version. I'm sure, I'm sure other people sing it slightly differently. Um, it certainly created a sense of community on the streets and, um, and in our recording, maybe you felt part of that little community of me and my friends singing that song. Um, so it's, that's community music. It's so clearly connected to our world. Um, Steve Lewis is a, is a great friend of mine, a performer, a facilitator who's been with me on a lot of those marches in Lancaster, on the trade union marches, on the May Day rallies um, and on the education marches in London. And recently we worked, we've been working together on Extinction Rebellion project and went down to London. And this is what he said. I guess you know you've mentioned that situation uh, where there were there were a lot of songs going around and not everybody knew them, but there were people who were willing to sing some. Uh, and it was very obvious the sort of grounded spirit that it gave to the situation. And even just having music playing, I remember sort of very wet, sort of slightly wet, damp, dispirited moments where you and I would start playing and something would begin to happen. And that, you know, the impact of that without it even being a song really, just the impact of the music had on what, on lifting people. Yeah. And yeah. Yes, my niece was uh, handcuffed to a boat in Amsterdam, uh, no, Antwerp, and um, one of three or four of them all chained to the boat, uh, surrounded by a massive crowd of um, rebels. And they, uh, she, yeah, she said that the, um, the singing around them just uh, gave her the confidence to uh, stay, continue the protest, and not only 
give you know give you the confidence to carry on to continue to protest but to um uh, know that it would be okay, you know, so she felt part of a, a massive thing even though she was isolated on her own um, underneath a pink boat. That was my friend Annie, a songwriter, choir leader and a, and a great community musician. And she explained how, having grown up in a political household, she then went to Greenham Common to, in the early 80s to those extraordinary anti-cruise, anti-nuclear occupation of that base. And she spent a long winter there singing, learning songs, rewriting songs, meeting um, people traveling up from across the world, um, coming to that base in solidarity to support that occupation. And that was the beginning of her really working with song and, and political protest. And now when she goes on demonstrations, sometimes with her, her current political choir, the Rabble Rousers, she finds that she's using her community music skills, her ability to engage strangers, um, her ability to read the room, to her constant awareness of what's going on around her, her knowledge of repertoire, picking songs from out of the air of things that just might work in that situation. Um, her confident leadership, having been in so many situations, just, you know, she kind of is able to turn a situation and really lead in a, in a unique way. These are all, key kind of community music um, aspects and of, of our practice. And from the other side, this was echoed by another friend, um, a woman called Claire, who's been a political activist all her life and been on countless demonstrations. And she described how on the recent Extinction Rebellion protests in London, she said, even with my, abil my inability to sing, I was singing in two minutes. It was so inclusive, so fun and so empowering. We know those words, don't we? <laughs> she went on to say, people like me, I'll quote, people like me are always attracted to where the band is, to the courage, the energy, the positivity that erodes fear. Collective noise, it keeps people in and involved. Again, this is all our community music world. And then she talked about how the songs of protests are really our oral history. They tell about the campaigns, the victories and the defeats. And they connect people from one protest to another over time and over, over the globe. Um, so, for instance, in Hong Kong at the moment, when they sing, Do You Hear the People Sing from Les Mis, it connects that, that critical human rights struggle in, in that city right back to the French Revolution. So, so to Hong Kong. I've been traveling there for 15 years now, building a community music program there and in Southern China that is trying to bring some positive ripples from a tragedy that happened just outside my window here in Morecambe on February the 4th, 2004. 23 migrant labourers died, caught at night by a fast incoming tide and by the quicksand after they were taken out by gangmasters who really didn't know what they were doing. I was working at the time for the locally based community music charity, More Music, and following a series of projects here in the UK that work with the Chinese communities here, we started to invest investigate international connections. And out of that came a partnership with Gus Mok in Hong Kong with his organization called the Center for Community Cultural Development. And through many, many projects, we've developed a whole community music project and program in the city that's quite significant in its changing lives of many, many people. And and as I've travelled there over the years, I've therefore obviously connected with the protests. And in particular in 2014 for the Umbrella Revolution. And then, of course, last year for those huge protests that lasted from May through till Christmas. Here is Eric, uh, a great community activist and artist, talking about the project that we ran called 24 Hours in a Revolution. I felt energetic as a community musician when I did a project in uh, 2014 in the Umbrella Movement. With my friends, we tried to write songs together with the people in the occupation that not all of them are supportive. But uh, we try to write songs listening to their stories so that we can record the history in a different way. 
from the big history that the government or the media is gonna write. And uh, I'm happy that I have captured 40 songs together with my friends. And this is one of the songs written with Gunn, a theatre technician who was with us and we were sitting, talking. We wrote these words on a piece of paper. I had my melodeon and we turned them into this song. When I'm here, I'm proud to wear the ribbon. When I'm here, I'm proud to sleep on the streets. When I'm here, I find my role in the movement. I know who I am. Every day is a different day. The mood moves, the tension changes. Every day is a different day. Day one, curious. Day two, explodes. Day three, stand up for your rights. Day four, frustration. Day five, we're winning. Day six, watch out, be alert. Day seven, surprise attack. Day eight, no sleep. Day nine, we're in control. Day 10, we're waiting. Day 10, we're ready to talk. Day 10, what's the next step? Day 10, we're ready to move on. No fear, we're strong. We're waiting for a reply. No fear, we're strong. We're waiting for a reply. Oh, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Yes, I think uh, songs in protests and songs that people sing for supporting and chants and speeches, they are all connected. If we're talking about the purpose of doing this kind of um, artistic expression, because they have different ways of connecting people's feelings. And I think without really trying to to make a clear political discourse. These are doing the work of the sensibles to change the way people understand and feel about the society and how it's organized. How fascinating. Um, the Hong Kong protest movement has been documented so in so many ways visually with photographs and films and some amazing visual art. And there have been some songs coming out of the Hong Kong movement, and particularly songs that bring people together in solidarity. So in 2019, that was the Glory to Hong Kong, uh, written by a guy called Thomas. It just arrived and became the unifying song, a, a new anthem for the city. The words talk about struggle and the prayer for unity and justice, and it's a, a fantastic singable melody, really simple. Just try and join in in this extraordinary orchestral version. Enjoy it.
year, in 2019, this anthem was everywhere, sometimes led by a solo saxophone in a mall, other times by a crowd at an occupation. It was just all over the place. I even did a one-man band version. You can check my YouTube channel out for a bit of a laugh. But on the street, what was going on? When the protests were at their height, there was no place for music. And this is an, another conversation. There were chants, yes, and shouts, but very rarely song. Except in early June, when many church leaders and church congregations came out to support the actions and the song Sing Hosanna arrived. A really simple melody, it can be around, and on one night it was sung continuously for over 24 hours at a vigil. Such a, a similar feel and energy to that Extinction Rebellion song we sang earlier. Um, and um, it, was, it kept on being a theme that came out at different protests to calm things down. Please, please feel free to join in and sing along to this film. So even though I'm not religious, I find that the song catches me and I can, I can get into that zone. So it's been extraordinary spending time in Hong Kong over the last period of time and witnessing that fight for human rights in the city and working with musicians there. Um, and following the, the violence last year in 2019, many of my friends who are community musicians and music therapists and art therapists have been using their skills um, to help people who've been traumatised by their, their role and their involvement in the protest, using their skills as therapists, their skills as storytellers, as facilitators. Um, this is just yet another role that community musicians can play in the movement. So I'm going to finish um, with a focus on, on the songs that are created by artists who are commenting and focusing attention on, on the issues of the time. That's an amazing line of musicians from Woody Guthrie through to Billy Bragg, from Nina Simone through to Stormzy. There's extraordinary, extraordinary history of songs. Um, inspiring, inspiring for us all, I'm sure. And a very good friend of mine, George Mackay, who's a community musician turned professor of media studies, um, has recently edited the Oxford Book of Punk Music. Great title. And um, he is talking to me and has written about the contribution that punk made to the anti-nuclear and anti-war movement in the late 70s and early 80s. Because music is a sort of, is an articulation and expression of conscience 
and it's um, it's um, it's a it's a congregationist thing. It brings us together, and it um, it speaks to and of identity and experience, and all of those are important ways in which you can have a um, a political music. Um, it's not usually quite the same as saying we played this song and then this law changed. You know, we played this song and then this happened. Although I like to point out, for example, that. Um, you know, I did this kind of survey of pop songs in the in the UK charts. Um, so I looked particularly at 1980, and I was looking for songs that were hit singles that were to do with um, anti-nuclear or anti-war uh, sentiment and expression. And I think there were 21 through the year, right? And almost every week of the year, there was at least one song, hit song in the charts, which was about that, about anti-war, anti-nuclear. Often there were six or seven songs in the charts about that very specific issue. It's an amazing thing. And um, so what, what, what effect does that have? Well, I like to say, um, you know, to think about, well, did we have a nuclear war? Well, there was no nuclear war, but we are still fighting the fight against armament sales continuously. And as the Black Lives Matter process have shown, wherever you look in the world, there is injustice. And the songs do make a difference. They do collect energy, they do focus people, and they do draw attention. Whether they're songs written by the stars that hit the charts, the songs about the killings, the songs about the protests, or the songs written on the streets, sung on small stages to small crowds. A friend of mine, Kimoy Walker, told about a song written and sung by a young man on a small stage in Moss Side that was just called I Can't Breathe. Just a song in that moment. Going to finish this, um, however, with a song by Adrian Mitchell, a piece that we wrote for the piece called Start Again, a celebration of 50 years of the Declaration of Human Rights. And this is called People Walking. Sometimes people walk together down the streets of their own cities. Weapons, but the truth. Sometimes a hundred people walk together down the streets of their own cities with no weapons, but the truth. Sometimes a thousand people walk together. Of their own cities with no weapons but the truth. Thank you.